Just as World War I was beginning in August of 1914, the Ottoman Empire had not as yet taken sides. But there were many factors that were already pushing them along the sides or having them lean towards the central powers. First of all, there was no, there was no love between them and the Russian Empire. On top of that, they already had close relations with the Germans. And on top of that, in August of 1914, they saw the Germans were able to roll through Belgium as they were executing on the first few stages of the Schlieffen Plan. So that was enough to convince the Turks that, hey, maybe we should join the, the, the war on the side of the Central Powers. And to kind of fir their first engagement in that war was to start to bombard Russian ports in the Black Sea, which they did in late October of 1914. They made bombards there, 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 which essentially was the trigger or was their kind of their way of saying, hey, we're in this war on the side of the Central Powers. A few days later, in early November, you have war officially declared from the Entente against the Ottoman Empire. So while that all of this was happening, you now have the Ottomans officially part of the Central Powers as we enter into November 1914. Let's turn our attention to the British Empire. The, for the Allies, at least so far, in, at the, the fall of 1914, it was not looking so good. The Germans were able to roll through Belgium. They were making offensive gains. It was starting to look a little bit more like a stalemate as we get into the end of 1914, but it was definitely not looking good for the Allies. The Germans were able to gain a lot of ground. And there were forces within the British military that were in favor of using their naval power to open up another front. And in particular, the other front that they wanted to open up was with the Ottomans. They were eager in order to capture the Dardanelles. And you can't see it that well in this diagram. We'll zoom in on it in a second. The Dardanelles is this strait right over here that connects the Aegean Sea with the, with the Sea of Marmara. And the reason why this was of interest to the British or to the Allies is that would open up shipping channels from the Mediterranean through the Aegean, through the Dardanelles, into the Sea of Marmara, through the Bosphorus, which is this strait right over here that you can't see too well, into the Black Sea, that would allow the Allies to reconnect with their Russian, with the Russian allies fighting on the Eastern Front, allow them to supply arms, allow them to supply aid, and also allow, allow them to provide support in the Black Sea, where now you have Russia in an ongoing naval conflict with the Central Powers. And the strongest proponent of the strategy of opening up this new naval front was Winston Churchill, who I'm sure you, you might have heard of. He's a prominent figure in World War II. In World War II, he is the prime minister of the United Kingdom. But at this point, he's just the first, not, I shouldn't just say just, it's still a very high position. He's the first Lord of the Admiralty. And if you're an American, it's like the equivalent of the Secretary of the Navy. And he was really in favor of trying to capture the Straits, the, 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 the Turkish Straits, the Dardanelles, the Sea of Marmara, and the Bosphorus, so that they could connect with the Russians so they could connect and arm the Russians in the Black Sea. Now, most folks who heard about this plan were not that enthusiastic about it, and that was because of how protected the Dardanelles were. And I'm now going to zoom in on about this part right over here. So let's zoom in on the Dardanelles. And this right over here is a zoomed in version of the Dardanelles. This is a little bit more zoomed out. This is the Dardanelles right over here. This right over here is the Gallipoli Peninsula. This is the Gallipoli Peninsula zoomed in a little bit. And then you have here, you don't see it that well on this map, but on, on this map right over here, you have the Sea of Marmara. And these maps, these old maps, are actually quite, quite fascinating because they show you why a purely naval offensive here was not that good of an idea. These red lines that you see that are numbered, you see literally number one, number two, number three, the legend here tells you that those are belts of mines, and they tell you exactly how many mines are in those belts. These little X-looking things right over here, these are forts that are sitting on the coast on either side of the Dardanelles, ready to bombard any ships that might try to make their way through the Dardanelles. There are some forts right over here at the opening. This right over here is a separate battery. So this is not a very, a very hospitable environment to try to invade with ships. But despite that, Winston Churchill was able to have his way. And so in 1915, February, 
1915, you have an Allied naval offensive that tries to capture the Dardanelles. Now, based on all of the foreshadowing that I've just given you, you might imagine that this offensive was not that successful. In fact, it was a bit of a disaster. And in fact, it was not successful. But the Allies were not ready, and Winston Churchill was not ready to, to give up just yet. They recognized, okay, just doing it purely on a naval basis uh, did not work. We need to have ground forces as well that can maybe help capture, that can maybe help capture some of the high ground, some of the high ground on either side of the Dardanelles, maybe capture some key strategic positions from which they can start to take, they can start to take out some of these forts and some of these batteries, and that'll give us the protection, give the Allies the protection in order to be able to make their way and take control of the Dardanelles, followed by the Sea of Marmara and, and the Bosphorus. So in March, or March was the time, by the time that they kind of recognized that the, the naval operation was going to fail, by April 25th, on April, April 25th, 1915, and this is a very important date, especially for Australians and New Zealanders. I believe New Zealanders is the word for someone who is from New Zealand. You have a ground assault on the Gallipoli Peninsula, and that's why it's often called the Gallipoli Campaign. So this right over here is the Gallipoli, Gallipoli, Gallipoli Peninsula. And they the ground troops attacked in two places, or they made their landfall in two places, right over here at the tip of the peninsula, right over here at Helles, and then further up the peninsula, further up the peninsula, right over, and it's not labeled as well right over here, but right over, right in this region, right over here, which is now known, and you see it a little bit clearer right over here, which was named Anzac Cove. And Anzac, Anzac stands for Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. And this is a, a huge day in the history of Australia and New Zealand. They were new dominions. They were part of the formerly part of the British Empire. They were starting to exert a little bit more independence. They were they were the, the major force, as you can imagine, right here at Anzac Cove. And even though that this was a huge debacle for the Allies, it's kind of a it's it's an important day in the military history of these countries, and it's a day of remembrance. And that's why April twenty fifth is called Anzac Day in Austria and New Zealand to commemorate this battle, this campaign, but also other military uh, the battles and victories that may have happened is kind of the equivalent of of their of their Veterans Day, but needless to say, April twenty fifth, you have they you have two ground assaults trying to capture the Gallipoli Peninsula. Neither of them were able to reach their reach their intended targets. At at some point, it started to just become a bit of a a protracted, unfortunately very bloody situation on the Allied side. So let me make this clear. On the Allied side, so the Allies brought about 500,000 500, troops to the battle. The Ottomans, the Ottomans brought, the estimates I've seen are in excess of 300,000 troops. They already were able to control a lot of the forts and the high ground, so they had the strategic advantage. The Allies had 250 thousand casualties. This includes deaths and wounded. The the Ottomans, the estimates I've seen is about 200, 200 thousand casualties. You have about 50,000 dead. So 50,000 of the 250,000 of the Allied casualties were dead. The the Ottomans, the estimates I've seen have about 60,000, 60,000 dead. And of these numbers, of the 50,000 dead, approximately 11,000 11,000 were from Australia and New Zealand, which is a huge number for any country, but especially countries as small as population-wise, especially New Zealand, but even Australia had a fairly, a fairly small population. So as we enter, as we start exiting 1915, it becomes clear that this is a huge debacle for the Allies. They have to retreat. And the only somewhat silver lining on this whole thing for the Allies was that the retreat was able to be done in a fairly a fairly efficient way. So the Gallipoli campaign, huge disaster for the Allies. Uh, Winston Churchill resigns his post in disgrace. He obviously is able to make a comeback later on because he's prime minister during World War II. And it's a, considered a huge victory for the Ottomans. They were able to push back this naval and this ground assault. And in particular, 
you have a gentleman who figures very largely, about as large as you can get in Turkish history, Mustafa Kemal, later to be known as Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, later to be the kind of the father of the Turkish Republic. But this is where he first laid his mark. He was the he was a commander of a division that was able to hold its ground. He start he's starting to appear as a military hero, and so he was a, the Ottomans and Mustafa Kemal in particular were big winners from the Gallipoli campaign.